Okay, um, hello. Uh, my name is Alex, and this is uh, Offline First Web Apps. I'm a web developer from Berlin. Uh, very grateful to Kenneth and all the others from the Cold Front team for having me. And I'm part of the team that makes um, Hoodie. It's a bit hard to explain what it actually is, but it's kind of an open source server that lets you build um, complete data-driven web apps from the front end. So if you don't want to deal with the back end, you don't really have to. And I'll talk about it later. Um, but it's a bit special in that um, the apps you build with it uh, are offline capable by default, which means they don't break when you disconnect from the network. And this is basically why we're all so interested in this topic. Um, but it's not a talk primarily about Hoodie, although it does come up a few times. It's more about the idea of offline first. And this is going to be dense and fast, but also not very technical. It's more about the higher level things like concepts, interfaces, experiences, and understanding what the problem is in the first, in the first place. And there are several hands-on talks uh, later today, which should get you going with the technical stuff. But before we get started, let's take a small detour and talk about building things. So from 1933 to 1957, there was a place called the Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And it was where great artists and thinkers from around the world wanted to remake education, wanted to make it holistic and give arts and sciences and crafts equal emphasis. And one of the teachers there was somebody you probably know, um, this guy, Buckminster Fuller, the geodesic dome person, seen here with a dome, because you never get photos of him without a dome. Anyway, he thought domes were the future of architecture, so he had his students build them. And please note this amazing Asian man smoking a pipe while hanging from this thing. Anyway, uh, he wanted to build domes, so he built domes. This is for the 1967 World Fair in Montreal, and this is the American Pavilion. This is like the American view of the future. And the future was coming, like everyone was hyped, you know, everything was the year 2000. And he wanted to build in a way that reflected this, you know, new forms of living, new forms of community, new materials. And the dome had lots of advantages. You know, it's very, very sturdy. It uses less material than a traditional building, it needs less energy to heat, and it just seemed like the structure of the future. Efficient, robust, highly aesthetic, and geometrically perfect. So why don't we all live in domes? Well, nobody lives in this one because it caught fire. Um, <laughs> but in, in general, we're in the future. We don't live in domes. What happened? Turns out what people really want is a building they can make their own that is robust, adaptable, and flexible. And brick, wooden, concrete boxes, you know, simple, dependable, proven, utterly traditional. And you may despair at how conservative people and their choices are, but you'll have to admit that in the end, you'd rather have a thing that works and the thing that acknowledges how your actual reality is. It doesn't have to be perfect because you're not perfect either. And ironically, when the Black Mountain College had to expand its facilities, this is what they built a box, because people want to have doors and cupboards and windows to lean out of and awnings to sit under and walls to screw shelves into, and they'd like to be able to put in dividing walls or extend the building. And it turns out, paradoxically, the most conservative, op most conservative options usually turn out to be the most adaptable and the ones most suited to everyday life, because that box could be any number of things to any number of people. It's adaptable to everyday needs. So keep that in mind for a second while we zoom back into the present. Let's look at how we build and how we work. So how we work is basically science fiction. You know, we, we may make web apps or native apps, it doesn't really make a difference. But we make stuff and while we make it, we imagine it, you know, being finished, which is necessarily in the future. And so we imagine them existing in a future where all the cool people are using our stuff and making us rich and famous. But our pitch is always, you know, in the near future, when I'm done with my work, your life will be better. And too often our industry will communicate this, kind of like science fiction too. So um, you may know Plastic, this is a small hardware startup that puts 20 credit cards in one kind of thing. And like practically every pre-order Kickstarter startup crowdfunding company, they have a vision and of course they have a video with ukulele music and everything. And it's basically a tiny slice of science fiction a year or two from now saying, here's how we imagine real human beings behaving in the near future. And they show the tech and everything, but it doesn't even really matter what the product is. They all work the same way by showing you this shiny, evocative, perfect, and slick future. And this scales. And this is the bit where I um, talk badly about the first major sponsor of this event. So um, Microsoft also loves imagining the future. 
and they regularly release a so-called productivity future vision. It sounds as if somebody just pulled three human resources buzzwords from a hat, but um, let's take a look at the one from this year. All right, so um, this should have sound, but it doesn't really matter. Nice. Okay, so you saw already every wall is a screen, everyone has tablets. This is HD 360-degree video streamed from under the sea. You will see um, the diver who does this in a minute. Everything is wireless. There are absolutely no wires connecting anything. Everything knows what you want. Everything knows what it's connected to. And then all of a sudden, someone drives a car for some reason. Um, this is the diver who made the video. And she's somewhere in rural Cambodia, going into a cafe with a foldy tablet thing and checking into the cafe looking at the menu and of course she just magically connects to the network and everything's cool and you can bend your batteries and everything and uh, anyway <coughs> you can sense my discontent for this kind of thing um, it feels totally wrong I mean it's so smooth it's just not normal enough and in the same video this is how they envision you talking to your dad who as far as I can tell from the video is in the same bloody building uh, and I mean, the whole thing is just this weird choreography of wealth and status, and everything is utterly improbable in its perfection. All the systems in the videos are always flawless. Everyone's happy. I mean, even, even old granddad with his wonky knee is happy, right? Because the technology works. Anyway, everyone's happy. Nothing is broken or smudged. There's infinite Wi-Fi with infinite bandwidth. No batteries run out. There's no traffic, no delays. Everything's perfect. And you should remember that guy's name, Tobias Revel. He's very, very good. Um, look up his work. And because it's so good, I'm going to steal some more of it. And this is the part where I talk badly about the second major sponsor of this event. Um, you all remember Google Glass, which used to be the future, now it's the past. But while it was still a thing, of course Google made a video for it. OK, Glass, record a video. We're on in two minutes. OK, Glass, hang out with the Flying Club. Google Photos of Tiger Heads. Hmm. You ready? You ready? Right there. OK, Glass, take a picture. Stop it at this point because it's interesting, because it's marginally better. There's normal stuff like playing with dogs or being late for a flight. Um, but the basic symptoms are the same. You know, the people and the lives and the circumstances, they're all total outliers. Really privileged people in this kind of post-scarcity scenario, as, as uh, Ravel puts it. It's a classic case of everyone suddenly being an ice sculptor and flying around in balloons. Uh, it's not normal. And again, the systems are perfect where the humans aren't. And it, again, assumes this perfect global network, even in the sky, apparently. So it's still improbable, but it has hints of normality. And now, let's go back a bit. This one is from 1969, um, a, vision from, a vision of the 1990s. And it's the same era as that dome I showed you from the beginning. So I'd just like you to picture that in your mind for a second before I press play, all right? The future, seen from the 60s. You've all seen the movies, OK? Now consider this was made by the British Post Office. Let's take a look at the sort of facilities we can get him. Worldwide communication, of course. Hello, Bill. This is Henry. Who? Who did you say? Henry. I'm calling from London. Gee, that's a pleasant surprise. Uh, how are things in your part of the world? Well, it's a dark, wet morning here. I suppose you've been basking in the sun all day. And, when we want it, you phone. 
in colour, using digital transmission by pulse code modulation right into the customer's premises. Well, let's have a look at you, Bill. Right, Henry, picture coming up. Gee, it's good to see you, Henry. You're certainly looking fit. How's Betty, Bill? She's right here now. Come over here, Betty, and say hello to Henry. Hello, Henry. Long time no see. But we can do much more than that. Library services, transmission of documents, share prices, bank statements. Let's take a look at the subscriber's terminal unit. To make a call, we take our service card. The code will be scanned electronically and establishes the caller's identity for charging the call. As she keys, the digits appear on her viewphone screen. Suppose she makes an error, she can clear and start again. I love this video so much. Uh, anyway, uh, but why, why is it better than the other two, in my opinion? Because it all seems rather normal. You know, it's not perfect. There's, a normal, there's normal people at normal desks and normal offices, and the very first thing that happens, it doesn't work properly. You know, the guy in Australia can't understand who the person from London is. And the weather's bad because it's London, and of course the weather's bad. It's just normal. And listen, suppose she makes an error. Now, apart from the 60s gender roles here, people don't make mistakes in Microsoft's future vision, and nobody has to ask Google Glass to do something twice because it doesn't understand them. And the topics, you know, leases, bank statements, mortgages, it's all normal, normal, normal. It's mundane, it's a bit wonky, but it's everyday life. It's what people do. But what all these three examples show is that thinking about the future is obviously a bit hard because um, for every miraculous iPad, there are countless partly broken realities like Wi-Fi passwords, connectivity, battery life, privacy, compatibility. And the real skill of creating a compelling and engaging view of the future lies not in designing the gloss, but seeing beyond the gloss to the truths behind it. So when, when I said, here's how we imagine real human beings behaving in the near future, what I really mean and what you really want is, here's how we imagine something utterly normal happening in the near future. The problem with all this is that we're not normal. You know, standing here as a part of a well-educated group of well-paid people in a tech industry in a super wealthy country, we're not normal. And the circumstances in which we work aren't normal either. They usually bear little relationship to how and where our products will actually be used. We build from shiny new Macs with full-size keyboards and well-equipped offices with fast connections, but the target environments are all usually radically diverse and different. And that's just us in our normal offices. You know, the closer you get to San Francisco, the exponentially less normal things get. But the thing is, it used to be that if your device could consume the web, it could also make it. That's no longer true for the majority of people, and that's something people my age have to get used to. So, we had to learn that people's devices were different than our dev machines. And now we have to realize that the circumstances they use their devices in are also different. And that requires a bit of an empathic leap. And because their, their experience of the web is not only different to ours now, it's also different to our historical experience of the web. Other people's first contact with the web now is just so completely different than our first contact with the web. But what counts, counts for us right now is that our circumstances define our mindset. We have the best tools and the best infrastructure available to us, and of course, that informs our mindset when we build all the shiny new future things. So an extreme example, if you're taking the Google or Apple or eBay or Facebook bus to work, you don't get the usual public transport experience. You've got free corporate Wi-Fi, air conditioning, leather seats, and your commuting experience is far, far removed from that of basically everyone else. And that's probably your baseline now. But in a way, we're all on the Google bus. We're all super privileged. And we frequently forget that we have to build for a normal world because that's where most of life happens. And in a normal world with normal people in it that have average budgets and average resources, that world from our perspective is overwhelmingly mobile. Phones are mobile, tablets are mobile, this MacBook is mobile. Hundreds of thousands of people use these with 3G or LTE USB sticks, and you might not, but they do. So the big gray box is a relic, and mobile is normal. And as you know, normality is imperfect. The web is very, very imperfect. The experience you're building is going to break for people, 
and it's imperfect in ways you cannot influence. You can write all the tests you want, but you can't fix people's 3G on the subway. And we do make attempts to import this reality into our work environments, so people have device labs. And I saw a talk the other day that showed this image saying, this is the internet now. That's not true. I mean, superficially, that's what the internet looks like. It's like the outermost layer of the internet. But what it really is is a bunch of devices connected to a dev server that is probably in the same room. And that iPad is never going on a plane. And that Kindle is never going on a subway. And that Game Boy is, no. Anyway, um, the point is, you don't have to carry all that around in the world to test it. The point is rather that you can now build experiences that accommodate this normality and experiences that go beyond your apps just breaking, becoming unresponsive, showing empty views, losing data, making people nervous with panicky error messages. You can now build apps in ways that acknowledge the fact that the web is imperfect and that your connections to it are also imperfect. You can have good experiences regardless. Because offline is not an error. It's a fact of mobile life and therefore a fact of normal life. It's just a state your app can be in, and a fairly likely one at that. It's not exactly an edge case. So here's the, the basic idea behind offline first. Beyond the first loading, just don't assume you have a network connection, because you might not. So how does that work conceptually? I'd like to show you quickly um, Hoodie's offline first architecture. Just one way to see this whole idea and how to solve it. So if you have an app or a web app, what needs to be offline? Well, obviously, the app would be nice. So the, the markup, the code, the styles, the images. And you can use app cache, service worker, native wrapper, phone gap, electron, whatever. You'll, you'll figure this out. It's not that terribly difficult. What's more interesting, actually, is that the app must handle data in a way that doesn't require a connection. And this is best done by reading and writing through a local data store in the browser, which syncs whenever possible to a server. So let's see how Hoodie does this. You have a front end and a back end, and in your front end, you've got your uh, sweet React, Ember, whatever uh, single page app. And it talks to the Hoodie library. And it only ever talks to the Hoodie library. It never ever talks to the local store itself. It never talks to the server. It never talks to the database. It only talks to the Hoodie store. And that takes care of putting stuff in the browser store, whichever one you may be using. So uh, we're switching to PouchDB now because it nicely encapsulates everything. But that's basically the front end. And that's kind of enough for an app. But assuming you want, to kind of, you want to store your data on a server as well, you need a server and you need a way to put things there. So we have a syncing engine that connects to a REST API and a CouchDB. And we always know what to sync because every user has their own private tiny database. And they have a copy of it in their browser. And we keep a copy of it over here. And they're all nicely separated from each other. And in the end, we have Hoodie itself, which is pretty tiny, and a lot of plugins written in Node. And they observe the database, and they do stuff to it. So if you're, for example, sending a direct message, you'd write your direct message in your interface. You'd put it in the Hoodie store. That would put it in the browser store. Whenever it can, it would sync it across here. It would appear here, emit an event. And then your direct messaging plugin would see, oh, look, a direct message. I probably have to do something. And it would put it in the recipient's private database. It would get synced back to wherever the recipient signs into a browser, into the app again. Hoodie would emit an event. And then your app would know, oh, hey, I have to display a message. And the good thing about this is that, that can be interrupted at any point, because we never have any element talk directly to each other. They only leave each other messages and tasks, like passive aggressive roommates. Uh, it's, it's all very loosely coupled and event-based, which means, yeah, uh, messages and tasks will be delivered and acted upon whenever possible. So we're, we've designed it for eventual consistency. The nice thing is, in most cases, the front end doesn't care whether the back end is actually there or not. It will hang on to your data and sync whenever it can. And if your UI allows it, you keep working without interruption. So offline apps are kind of the web's honey badgers. They just don't care. You know, They just do their thing. Bees, tunnels, bad connectivity. The offline badger keeps on going, robust and fault tolerant. Anyway, point was, if you want true offline capability, your app shouldn't try to directly bridge this gap. There should always be a syncing engine in between, and you should always keep a local copy of your user's data in the browser. 
And sync is really pretty hard. You probably don't want to be implementing this yourself. It's just so much to get wrong. But whatever technology you choose, getting into the offline mindset requires only one key realization. When you leave the world of timely, reliable communication, the local database, and not the servers, it must be the gateway for all persistent changes in application state. So this must be terribly difficult to implement, right? No, it's magic. Anyway, no, it's not magic, of course. It's one line of code. So this is what using hoodie looks like. There's a hoodie object. Oh, my laser pointer broke. No. Um, it has a store object. The store has an add method. And then you add stuff to it. You know, and you have to specify a type. And then just you know, an object with stuff in it. And that's it. That's how you add stuff to the, the data store. This is how you sign up a new user. There's an account object. It has a sign up method. You give it a username and a password. Fairly obvious. And if you want to update your UI when the store changes, the store has an on method. You specify what type of event you want to listen to and a handler. And then you handle stuff. So how do you make this work offline? That's it. That's all you need to do. All you need to do is embrace this decoupled event-based architecture, which you probably do anyway. And that's it. It's not a special feature you explicitly have to invoke. It's how the entire architecture works. You get offline for free. So let me just show you that in action so you believe me it's a real thing. Um, let's make a new hoodie app. And let, let it just fetch stuff from NPM and prepare everything. Uh, CD into there. And do hoodie start. And that'll start all the backend processes and the database itself and launch all the plugins and open it in a browser. And of course, and I'm very sorry for this, it's a to-do app. Um, because to-do apps are the Rosetta Stone of the internet. It's where programmers learn all the other, other languages. Anyway, there's an input field over there which you can't see very well. And if you type something in there, it appears in a list. Big deal. Um, what happens when you type into the input field is basically what I just showed you. It just calls hoodie store Come on, type faster. Add. And then we say, OK, it's a to-do. And then we give it a title. And yeah, it gets written into the database. Bam, there we go. And then the interface listens for this on event, or rather the add event via the on method. So everything goes into the database, and the UI listens to events, and then it'll just show up. So, so far, no big deal. But we're not signed up. So if we open this in a different browser, we won't get our to-dos. So let's make an account. We do hoodie account, sign up, give it a username and a password, a super safe password. And we can just check if we're really logged in and see if we have a username. Yep, brilliant. OK, and let's see if this works. So now we're going to open this in a second tab. Just copy that. Oop. And there we go. Everything syncs across. Oh, no, actually, it doesn't because I was looking at the wrong tab. This is all too big. I'll just go over here. Anyway, let's sign in. That's fairly similar. Oh, yeah, of course, nothing is here because the two instances don't know about, about each other. So we do hoodie account, sign in, same credentials. Super safe password. And everything just appears. Right, now if we type something into the, into the input, it gets synced to the server. And if we type something over there, it also gets synced to the server and appears on the other one. And we're still only doing hoodie store add. It's still the same thing. There's nothing additional that makes this work. OK, now let's break everything and stop the server. And of course, if you type in something now, it's not going to sync, because the two browser instances don't know about each other. They sync via the server. But you'll also notice that the interface still works. You can just continue using it just as you did before. In fact, you might not even notice you're offline, which is pretty sweet. Um, so let's turn it back on. la di da 
Come on. Okay, and um, everything's already synced back in place. No reloading, nothing, it just works. And you can just continue using it. Okay, so you see, you don't only get offline for free, you also get multi-device sync for free. You can use this on your tablet and on your MacBook on the, at the same time, and everything will just sort itself out. And you can just disconnect, and if you build your UI in a way that can accommodate it, you can just keep on working. And this kind of uh, illustrates our underlying strategy. If you can make it unobtrusive and simple, make it unobtrusive and simple. The simpler it is, the more people can use it, and you can still expose all the hardcore bits for people like you. And yeah, accommodate everyone if you want. Sweet. Now what? So we felt like we solved some of the technical aspects of offlining apps. And now we were wondering, what does this actually mean? Which opportunities does this give us exactly? And which problems can we now solve? And in my research, I noticed I was suddenly reading articles from an area of computer sciences I wasn't really expecting. Because if you have several data stores with the same data in your system, you're suddenly in the distributed systems business, for better or worse. And you've got a whole new range of problems and opportunities. Um, and before I get into that, I thought, why not look at the insights that world has already gained, and maybe we can save some time. So as we all know, there are only two hard problems in distributed systems. Number two, exactly wants delivery. Number one, guaranteed order of messages. Number two, exactly wants delivery. Now, seriously, though, there are three things that pop up again and again. And the first is that knowing the, the cost of knowing the truth is prohibitively expensive. And what this means is, assume you're buying something from Amazon, uh, and the vendor system is not actually checking whether the item is physically present in a warehouse or even whether the warehouse is actually still there. The warehouse might be on fire. The Amazon web interface wouldn't know. Um, doing this check to find out whether the warehouse is on fire is prohibitively expensive and quite challenging. And there are other factors, like five other people may simultaneously buy something that's only in stock once. And you can throw lots of money at engineering and try and make this perfect and prevent the four sales by matching up the digital system with the real world but you're really pushing the limits of practicality and physics. Um, and it makes much more sense to have your systems make educated guesses and assumptions and make trade-offs on the few occasions where they're wrong, and then apologize to people and recover from these edge cases and race conditions. Second thing is, there is no now. This is just physics. So the parts of your system are not just distributed conceptually, there's actual physical distance in between them and that introduces latency. Plus, your data realities can partition when they're no long, longer connected to each other, and you can have separate timelines, which you then have to merge up again. And in the end, what that really means is that failure is not an option, it's an inevitability. Warehouses catch fire, connections go down, trucks drive off bridges, networks partition, hardware fails, software is buggy. We can't know everything, we can't control everything, so how can we gain certainty about anything? Now, Tyler here is urging people to stop trying to build perfect systems. But that's only half of our problem. You're building your app to be perfect, but at the same time you're expecting the system it runs on to be perfect as well. Just like the video, the Microsoft and Google videos I showed you. They assume a perfect world for that services and apps to run on. And in any case, these three points nicely align with the problems we found people were actually having when offlining stuff. So, we held workshops and talks and wrote blog posts and spoke to lots of people. And we, surprised, we were surprised at how many developers suddenly kind of opened up and said, yeah, we had similar problems. We never really spoken to anyone because it wasn't a thing. You know? And people had very interesting and specific problems ranging from building, and I quote, runkeeper for fish, uh, for anglers in the Norwegian wilderness, and to several people trying to build point of sale systems for limited resources. But we identified some central themes. The first and most pressing issue people seem to have is that they can't trust their apps to do the right thing when the connections get dodgy. So, as a mobile app user, no wait, um, scratch that. As an app user, I want to be sure that my data is actually available when I need it. And that is so fundamental, I think it gets forgotten most of the time because it's just so fundamental. Of course users want to have their data ideally all the time, but it used to be a painful problem and it was easier to just fail, show an error, blame the telecom. But you can do a lot better and offline first is the way to go. So let me illustrate the problem. 
Um, this is the German Railway advertising that you can apparently book tickets and use the app under any circumstances, even when free soloing in the Alps. Because remember, in the tech future, everyone's into extreme sports and ice carving. Um, contrast this with the real world, where there's this guy who cannot access his ticket because it's in the app, and the first thing the app does when you open it is try to connect to a server, which doesn't work when you're on a high-speed train in Germany. Um, it fails, and it fails slowly, while a ticket inspector is breathing down your neck, a German ticket inspector, and this is a bad user experience. <laughs> so the solution would obviously be to store personal data and tickets locally and not make the initial communication with the server blocking. Similarly, another symptom is people taking screenshots of their apps because you can't trust them to retain your data, especially when traveling. Who here does this? Thank you. So I went to Japan recently. This is my camera roll. It's half photos and half screenshots of bloody Foursquare. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, you, you, you really have to be afraid the data you'd only just fetched would disappear a few seconds later. This kind of thing happens a lot. There was data in all of these views, and then I made a terrible mistake, like switching apps or putting the phone in my pocket for a minute. Because the app stitched the data, they fail at loading new data, and then you're stuck and have no data at all, and that's just not cool. So if you build offline-first apps, you get more trustworthy and reliable apps, which is cool. Next problem. Many apps are designed to work only while connected because the people who designed and built them are always connected even when there's absolutely no intrinsic requirement to do so. So you can do things differently nowadays. It's not like the, the age of the thin client and the, the expensive server which is in the university somewhere. You know, you have all the computing power in your pocket. So when I'm offline, I want to be able to use features that don't require a connection. If you're only viewing your own data or adding data yourself, why doesn't this just work, online or offline? You should be able to add meetings, mark a task as done, write a message, check in, post a picture. You know, you store it now, you sync it later, you don't get in the way of people. And again, this is an opportunity. You get more useful and more usable apps. This is directly linked to the next one. My data isn't with me. It's probably on a server in the US somewhere. If you're lucky, it's on a CDN as the same continent, uh, on the same continent as you. But it's my personal data. Why is it not on here or on here? I might need it, and you don't know when. Plus, in most syncing scenarios, I'm the authority over my data. So let, let me have a local copy, or even better, you just do the backups. I'm in charge. And granted, this gets problematic if you're doing something mega collaborative, like Google Spreadsheets with 20 users or something. But if you have a use case where your user data is fairly well isolated, you can easily do this. And you could easily do this years ago. So the potential benefit is always accessible personal data. Super fast, always available, simply reliable. Next thing is that apps often require advanced planning to be useful. So ideally, I'd want an app to preempt my needs in a sensible manner, because I don't know in advance when I'll be offline. If I knew in advance when I'd be offline, we wouldn't be having this problem, because we could prepare for it. So apps should ideally have recent data in them when you open them. Nowadays, you expect your podcast app, for example, to download new stuff as it appears and not when you open it, because when you open it, you're on a subway and you don't have network. And this is wonderful for offline, too, because think, you can think about whether your apps should just hang on to data or even prefetch new data for your users before they might need it. In a similar vein, obviously important data should probably be stored locally as well. So the Dropbox app is nice in this regard. So if you fave something on your phone, it's now on the phone, always. And that's a really good assumption for them to make because it's obviously important to you. And you could take this a bit further. Um, sure, you can have offline maps. You need to know in advance, though. You get an offline map apps, maps app, <laughs> uh, or get Google Maps to cache your surroundings, but you know, just think of the future. Google knows where you live, right? So imagine if it would just preemptively download your surroundings as soon as it sees you're on Wi-Fi in a foreign country. That would be practical. It would also be a bit spooky. But um, this, this nicely demonstrates some of the issues, though. 
you might need new UI elements, you might need a new design language to communicate this to people. Plus, you need to answer some interesting questions. How long will the cached map be retained? Does it get flushed at some point? Can I remove it when I don't need it anymore? Can I cache more than one at a time? And if yes, is there a limit? In short, how does it work and can I trust it? For you as a developer, can you make it trustworthy while hiding all the complexity? There's a lot of interesting new questions, but there's a cool opportunity of making apps that are just so useful because they preempt the user's need. But that was already pretty tricky now, and that brings us to the challenges. It's becoming obvious that there are any number of new things you could be doing, and that most of these new things require new interfaces, and in some parts, even a new way of talking about this kind of thing, because you have to communicate stuff to users you, ha you didn't have to communicate before. So at the most basic level, if your app behaves differently depending on whether it's connected or not, you probably have to make this clear somehow. And Threema, for example, does this. I don't know if anyone still uses it. It's kind of dead. But um, did this nice thing where it displays this connectivity stripe. So red, disconnected, yellow, connecting, green, connected. And on first run, it explains to you what that means for you as a user. Another big issue is how do we communicate the states your data can be in? It could be stored locally, it could be scheduled for syncing, it could be synced, it could be possibly out of date, it could be in conflict. And just as an example, possibly out of date is a state you'll get quite often in offline capable apps, and you'll have to decide how crucial the age of data is and whether and how you communicate it, because old data can still be useful while potentially being wrong. So think train schedules. They could be wrong, but they communicate intent, and that's valuable. And Old tweets are still tweets. You know, they're, they're not just magically worthless because they're you know, two, two hours old or something. You might still want to see them. You could just as well selectively hide, disable, or rephrase features. So imagine a save button that knows whether it's connected to the server and changes accordingly. Or you could just let users save either way and inform them about the state of things after the fact. And if it doesn't work, Apologize and deal with it. There are loads of ways to solve this problem, depending on the use case, who you're developing for, and how crucial the data is to them. But one thing you'll probably have to do is inform users about sync outcomes. And not just whether they succeeded or not, but how and possibly even why data has changed in their browser, and how and possibly why data has changed that they're currently looking at. Because that's what happens when you get syncing. And that's easily one of the hardest problems, UI problems related to sync. So I said that if users only add data, why not always just let them do that and sync later? Well, it turns out things aren't quite as simple, and that context really matters. So here's a fairly simple chat example to illustrate some of the things you have to keep in mind. So you have a chat. A says hi, B says yo, A says meet me on Thursday, B says sure, I'm free. A says, oh wait, I meant Tuesday. Now imagine that B's second message was written while one of them was offline, uh, on a train, in a plane, on a submarine, whatever. So it's gone. But you have a cool offline first app, and it just syncs things. So the offline user reconnects, and the messages sync up again, and A receives B's missing message. Where do you put it? You can put it in the chronologically correct place, which makes sense in a thread context, because the order carries meaning. But then, you know, the chat may continue, and this kind of thing might happen. And if you put it there now, it's useless because nobody will see it. So that's a UI challenge in itself. The, the alternative is, of course, to do what I think iMessage sometimes seems to do, is display it in the flow according to the time it arrives at. But that guarantees that the message will be seen by A, but it also changes the meaning of the message because the message order is meaningful. It was supposed to be this way around. And this is only text-based, you know, really one-dimensional data, a simple, simplest example I could think of, really. What do you do with deleted items and things that can't be organized in lists or objects that are in themselves not immutable but have properties? And there's a whole lot of potential for complexity here. Because the web, web platform is becoming more and more powerful and capable. Here's a photo editor, and it's not Photoshop. And it's not trying to be. It's quick, it's easy, there's no installation, it's cross-platform, auto-updates, and it does most of the things you want from a simple photo editor. At some point, you'd probably like it to work offline as well, though. This is an experimental, collaborative, multi-track recording app, and it runs in the browser. 
part of a master's thesis by Jan Monschke, and it's really bleeding edge from, from last year. Um, but imagine where this might be when the tech matures a bit more. It's practically cross-platform garage band, and that's really damn cool. But again, you can't use it offline, and that's a disadvantage in comparison to the native apps it competes with. But aside from the competing with native apps thing, what are the advantages of doing something offline first? So the first thing is obviously performance. We put stuff on CDNs to move it closer to the user, but the closest thing to me right now is the phone in my pocket and the MacBook in my bag. Put your app in there, put your data in here. Zero latency. That's the way to the snappiest experience. And the data may be old, but at least it's there and I can look at something while you're loading the rest. And in many cases, as I said, time doesn't even invalidate the data. So there's still a benefit to having it. Second thing is robustness. Offline capability protects from service interruptions. And interestingly, we hadn't really anticipated this. So we have a service running on Hoodie uh, with quite a few users, which we had to take down for maintenance. And most of them didn't notice because it doesn't hit the server that often. And they have the app cached. It just works. The server's down. Nobody notices. It's cool. Turns out it doesn't matter if your app can't reach the server because the user is on the subway or because the server is down. It'll still work. And better experiences. Apps don't lose data, apps are more trustworthy, apps are more usable and useful, and they cause less frustration. I mean, you're saving to a local store first. You can save every single keystroke if you want and sync to the server every couple of seconds. You can forget save buttons altogether if you like. There's a lot to be gained from an offline-first architecture that's not completely obvious at first glance. Plus, it's kind of a spectrum, you know? You don't have to go all out and offline all the things. You can have incremental benefits from doing parts of it. Anyway, web platform is amazing, and this is just a start. So at JSConf EU last year, there was a lot of talk about service worker, client-side storage, and web crypto, all just coming into existence then, cutting edge, wildly promising. And now, the very next talk you'll get today is about, if I understood it correctly, building an app with those technologies. It's only ever going to get better. And if it's in the browser, it's going to be used in a mobile context. And if it's going to be used in a mobile context, it's going to be offline at some point. And it's not just about increased mobility anymore. At some point, the browser transformed from being an, a document viewer into being the world's most advanced, discussable, uh, widely distributed application runtime. It's a very attractive platform to developers for many reasons. And as it gets more mature and you offload more things into it, People want a mature and solid experience, and waiting for more cell towers to be built won't help your users. Your apps have to work. So here's the conclusion. We can't keep building apps with a desktop mindset of permanent fast connectivity, where a temporary disconnection or slow service is regarded as a problem and communicated as an error. So in closing, don't forget you're from the future, and what's normal to you probably isn't normal to most of the rest of the world. Also. Learn to let go a bit more. Find a sensible middle ground between certainty and assumption. Please just dive in. There's actually a lot you can do already. So last year I finished a prototype web app that works completely offline. It has offline maps. It can take photos while offline and store them until you're back online. It runs in the browser and it runs well on my dodgy nearly four year old Android phone. Totally possible. And it's only going to get easier, faster, and more stable from here on out. Also, raise awareness. And that this is actually a thing, you know, among fellow developers, yes, but also among users, because people at some point need to get used to their browsers and websites being able to work offline. It's, you know, you're used to your email working offline as well. But opening the browser, entering a URL while you're not connected to anything is still very alien to most people. They just don't expect it to work. And finally, please join in. Um, so we, we've done this Offline First thing at offlinefirst.org to start bringing people together on this. We've got a pretty active Slack channel. Uh, and there's a newsletter I can really recommend. And in any case, please come join us. And finally, be proud of that dependable boxy thing. It's actually quite cool. And also, um, don't panic, use Hoodie. Uh, come talk to me if you want to know more about Offline First or Hoodie. And I also have really sweet stickers if you want those. So thank you very much. Um, the presentation is online here. Now, thank you. Thank you.